All right, everybody. Welcome back to Strongman Personal Finance. I am your host, Christopher Bell, certified public accountant, long-term Boglehead investor, and hero that is going to save you from making bad investment decisions. Now today, we're going to look at Corsair Gaming. Now in my previous videos, I've dumped on a lot of terrible stocks that YouTubers have been promoting. Because a lot of these stocks have no revenues, or they've been generating massive and increasing losses, and they're just a not good place to put your money. Now, Corsair Gaming, on the other hand, isn't necessarily a bad place to put a small percentage of your portfolio as a speculative play. Now, full disclosure, I don't own Corsair Gaming. I don't have a lot of individual stocks. And I'm not saying you should buy it. But what I want to impart on you in this video is that by looking at the financial statements of the company, it's not necessarily bad. There are some risks and things could go south for the company. But if you're going to choose between like AMC or Corsair, you might want to consider Corsair because at least it has some decent fundamentals. But like I said, I'm not saying to buy this stock. I'm not buying it. I thought about it, but I'm not necessarily convinced yet that it's a good buy. And we'll kind of explain why. So the first thing I want to do is look at the stock's history. So it looks like it IPO'd pretty recently, very recently, on September 23rd, 2020. And since then, it's gone up 95%. Now, past historical returns don't really matter to me. What matters to me is where the stock is going in the future. And to do that, you have to make a bunch of assumptions, which is why, in my opinion, I think the finance profession at large is kind of like, it's almost like voodoo, because you don't really know what's going to happen in the future. But what you have to do is project revenues and basically every other item on the income statement and the statement of cash flows to kind of figure out what a good price it is to pay for the stock at the current time. Because you can buy the stock now, let's say you project cash flows or whatever into the future, you could buy the stock at a certain price now and get a certain percentage gain. But the higher gain that you want, the higher the discount rate that you have to use on the projected future cash flows of the stock. Now, I haven't done a discounted cash flow analysis of the stock, but at least looking at the fundamentals, it's not that bad. Now, before we dive into the fundamentals, let's go ahead and look at the website. So, it recently IPO'd. I don't know how long this company's actually been in business, but it looks like they provide mostly like high-end gaming stuff. So, you have like gaming gear, new hot products, keyboards, headsets, mice. Okay. I mean, this seems pretty cool. I'm a gamer myself, and I think the gaming industry will keep growing into the future. How fast, I can't say. I'm not a prognosticator. I'm not... Nostra Strong Manus, or whatever you want to call me. So, I also read in the 10K that they kind of appeal to, number one, high-end gamers and people that like to build their own PCs. So, they have PC components. So, you can buy cases, coolers, fans, memory cards, whatever. I don't build PCs, so I don't really know much about this stuff. But you can build your own PCs, order all the products, and they'll ship it to you, which is cool. Okay, they got gaming PCs, software... I didn't even look at their software. But it's not bad. I mean, there's some cool stuff. But just because it's cool and exciting doesn't mean you should put your money into it. You need to read the 10K, look at the gaming industry as a whole, and kind of consider how dominant this company could potentially come. Because right now, the market cap of this company is $3 billion. Now, the the total market cap of like chip suppliers and component suppliers, I don't know what that is. But this company will eventually grow to a certain point where it captures a certain percentage of the market. If you believe they're going to capture more of the market going into the future and that market's going to grow, okay, it's probably a no-brainer. But it's all based on assumptions. You can't predict the future. And I mean, looking here at the price-to-earnings ratio, that's not horrible. I don't trust Robinhood. For some reason, their P.E. ratios are always jacked up. But... I think their P.E. ratio is actually lower than that, but we won't look at that right now because right now I just want to look at the fundamentals. So I pulled up their 10K, which is their annual financial report, and we're going to just read about the business a little bit. So it's a leading global provider, innovator of high-performance gear for gamers and content creators. 
We help digital athletes from casual gamers to professionals to perform at their peak. Okay. We design and sell high-performance gaming and streaming peripherals, components, and systems to enthusiasts globally. Maybe I should buy from Corsair Gaming. Gaming. All right. So Okay, so they've been around for about two decades, and I guess they recently went public. So that's cool. And then they have, you know, some cool stuff that they sell. I'm, I don't hate this company. I mean, this is better than the other companies that people are pumping on YouTube. All right. And then they kind of talk about the industry. I mean, the gaming industry is probably going to grow, especially overseas. I mean, as more people move into the middle class. Like, I used to live in Korea when I was young. And gaming was huge there, especially StarCraft Brood War. And it's still pretty freaking massive over there. So I wouldn't be surprised in Korea, China, you know, maybe even India one day, who knows. There's going to be massive and massive growing demand for gaming. But my one worry about this company, and it'll kind of be more apparent when we look at the income statement, is they had a pretty significant revenue spike in 2020. And I actually read somewhere here in the 10K that the company thinks that's because everybody was locked down, everybody was bored, I'm kind of like paraphrasing here, and people were just kind of buying gaming stuff, which makes sense, you know? So my main worry about this company is that even though revenue trends have been positive, cash flow trends are positive, what I worry about is that in 2020 there was a huge spike, but now that everything's reopening, are people still going to be buying their stuff at the same rate that they were before? That's where a lot of guesswork comes in when you're an investor. But, like I said, there's positive trends in this company, so I can't knock it too much. I know Jeremy Lefave likes this company. At least he picks decent companies sometimes. And this is one of them that I'm not 100% opposed to like those other stupid companies I talked back talked about. All right, so I read a little bit about the business. That's cool. Uh, <clears throat> you also want to read management's discussion and analysis. They kind of talk about the financial results. They summarize them for you. But you can't depend on that entirely. You actually have to go look at the numbers yourself. So reading that, impact of industry trends, increasing gaming engagement. We believe the gaming's increasing time share of global entertainment consumption will drive continued growth in spending on games and gaming gear. That's not a bad assumption. The only thing I, wor I worry about is it seems like it's a lot of high-end stuff. So if you have like developing countries, I mean, they probably, you might not get a lot of sales in those countries because a lot of this crap they sell is really expensive. It's more like high-end, you know, aficionados that buy it. So, okay, they talk about their revenue growth or where they sell it from. So they sell through Amazon and they sell, their 10 largest suppliers supply roughly 52% of their sales. So, okay, I mean, they have a decently diversified network of distributors, which isn't bad. You don't want to be dependent on one distributor. Okay, impact of COVID-19. Here's where I read that, that thing I was talking about with the... Uh, Potential revenue with, with, with the revenue spike in 2020. Okay, here it is right here. Further, we believe that the increased demand of our gear has been driven in part by individuals seeking to improve their work from home setup. This increase in demand continued into the second half of 2020. However, as global economic activity slows down, the demand for our gear could decline because of these trends. So everybody's going back to work, potentially. Everybody's able to go out and do things now, so maybe they won't invest as much money in like cool gaming or streaming gear. We'll have to see. All right, so let's go ahead and look at their financial statements. And if you've watched my videos before, you kind of know what I'm looking for, but we're going to do it anyway because it's my channel. All right. So first thing, revenue growth. So in 2018, they had $937 million of sales, okay? And that grew to a billion, almost uh, $1.1 billion in 2019. In 2020, they had almost... 700 million more of sales now like i was saying is that increased because people were bored and they were just buying a bunch of crap online or is that a sustainable trend we'll have to see now their gross margins which is their gross profit divided by their revenue they have increased slightly which is a good thing so they're basically paying less to buy the materials that they're then selling to people now that could be that could be because People were willing to pay a higher price for the products because there was so much demand for this kind of stuff during the lockdowns. We'll see what happens to the gross margin going into the future. But right now, I mean, it's not bad and I'm not entirely against it, but I wouldn't be comfortable enough to invest in this company quite yet. But we'll see. All right, so operating income. So they had a massive explosion in 2020. That's from 
Hmm. Yeah, that's mostly just from increasing sales. I mean, it looks like they're selling general administrative expenses increased and their product development increased. And then we go down to net income. So they had losses on an accrual basis of accounting in 2018, 2019. The positive thing is that the losses were decreasing. And then in 2020, they had a pretty significant profit. So that's not bad. They had like 103 million of profit. Earnings per share, 120. Let's go look at the balance sheet, see if they're really diluting the shareholders. There is the balance sheet. All right, so now we're looking at the balance sheet. Snapshot on a point in time tells you the company's assets, liabilities, and equity. Now, the first thing you want to look at is the current ratio, which tells you if the company is likely to be able to pay off its short-term debts within the next year. Those are paid with current assets, and they're usually used to pay current liabilities. So we look at total current assets, $690 million dollars and total current liabilities, $505 million. So they have enough current assets to pay their liabilities. But if you look at their inventories, it's $226 million. Now inventories and prepaids, which were $37 million, those are a little bit more difficult to liquidate quickly, depending on how fast their turnover is, and to be able to be used to pay for current liabilities. So is their current ratio bad? No, but if you look at it, from the quick ratio standpoint, from the acid test ratio, where you subtract out inventories and prepaids, it looks like it might even be under one. So most likely the company isn't going to go out of business, but that's not the best current ratio or quick ratio in the world. And let's see what it was last year, 429. All right, so it looks like it may have been a little bit higher in 2019, but I don't think this company is going to imminently go out of business. I'm not worried about that. Now, let's look at debt. Let's see what happened with long-term debt. So they actually reduced some long-term debt. That's good. So they're actually going to probably have less interest expense. We'll see. And let's see, accumulated deficit. Okay, your accumulated deficit is, is, your, is your losses stacked up on each other. So in 2019, it was $106 million, And then it went down to $2.8 million. That's because they had that massive profit in 2020. And then we have... Common stock. Now you want to look at the common stock to see how badly they're diluting the current shareholders. So at the end of 2019, they had 84, is that in thousands? Maybe maybe it's just 84,000 shares. They had 84,000 shares in 2019, and then they issued a little bit more, and now they have 91,000, almost 92,000 shares outstanding. Now, that's not a massive increase. It is a little bit of dilution to the current shareholders, but it's not as bad as these other companies that the Wall Street Bets clowns are looking at. So that's not the end of the world right there. All right, now let's go look at the statement of cash flow. So you wanna look at the statement of cash flows because that tells you a different story. It tells you how the cash is coming in or where the cash is coming from. Are they generating positive cash inflows from operations or are they basically surviving off debt and selling assets? So looking at the statement of cash flows, you wanna look at net cash provided by operating activities. So it was 422,000 in 2018, 37 million in 2019. That's a pretty good increase. And then of course they had that even greater explosion in 2020, 168 million. So that's not bad growth. But like I said, is 2020 an aberration or is it not? I don't know. We'll have to see. Net cash used in investing activities. All right, so it looks like they're mostly, okay, they bought a business in 2019. Interesting. Payment of deferred consideration. I don't know what that is. Okay, so basically the, the main thing that stands out to me here is that they bought a business in 2018 and they bought a business in 2019 and then they bought, I guess, they reduced the amount of other companies they were buying in 2020 because they only spent 1.2 million in 2020. So whatever, they're buying businesses, they're expanding. Now, the next thing we wanna look at is the net cash provided by financing activities. We had 47 million provided by financing in 2018. That was from debt and, okay, all debt and a little bit of proceeds from exercise of stock options. 2019, they got their money from debt and a stock issuance. And then in 2020, it looks like they had, okay, that was their proceeds from their IPO. So they are diluting their shareholders a little bit, but it's not crazy high so overall my opinion on this company if you want to speculate on it you do whatever you want to do 
I'm personally not going to invest in it yet. I know there was a big run-up recently. Some people say it's from Wall Street Bets, but I don't know. But in my opinion, it's a little too early to get in. I want to see at least one more year once everything reopens and to see if the revenue growth was actually sustainable or if it was just a one-time thing caused by the virus. So that's my thoughts on that. So I don't hate every single stock, ladies and gentlemen. But that's it. If you like this, like the video, subscribe to my channel, tell your friends about me, buy my book, Stop Being a Broke Loser. It's on Amazon for $3. And y'all have a wonderful, delicious, superstitious, surreptitious day.